Hello, adventure enthusiast! Here are some vintage trading videos EBO produced in the late 1990s. These videos actually helped get us blacklisted from a leading trade association. After all, training was reserved for only certain approved vendors, right? Ha ha ha! Fast forward to present day where the coronavirus has shut down our industry. Every vendor seems to be clamoring for a virtual presence and is creating training content in this new era of online learning. So we thought it about time to blow off the digital dust and make these videos available once again. Enjoy! All right, I want to start right now looking at our pole selection. You can build a ropes course in trees, internal structures, H-beams, this course today that we're fi filming at is actually going to be built on utility poles. Now, the way the standards are the day of this taping, the class 2 utility pole is needed for any belayed ex exercise. So on the high ropes course, you'll see later on in this tape, it's all class 2 50 foot poles. The poles I have here in the ground around me are actually class 3 or class 4 poles, which we're going to section up and use for low ropes course elements such as a wild woozy, a mohawk walk, or a tension traverse. A couple things about a pole we want you to be aware of if you're not already. The first thing is you can tell a class of a pole and its length by a branding stamp which is typically 10 feet off the butt of the pole. If that brand is not legible or scuffed or scraped off, at the very base of the pole itself is an aluminum tag with just the class number and its overall length. So between these two reference points, you should be able to identify what a pole is at those two markings. Whenever you put a pole in the ground, right now the recommended depth is 10% of the overall pole length plus an additional two feet. And that will vary slightly depending upon soil content. And if I had a sandy loam soil with a lot of grain and uh, pea gravel in it, I might actually go an extra foot or two just to make sure that pole is nice and solid. Here at EBL, we do not recommend the installation of concrete products at the base of the pole as this will help in moisture retention and also rot at the butt of the pole itself. So in this case, this pole here is a class 4, 35 foot pole, and if we were to put this pole in the ground today, we'd have to go 3.5 feet, which is our 10% mark, plus 2 additional feet for 5.5. I'd round up and say 6 foot and call it safe. However, this pole, we're going to section it off and use it for a while, woozies. So if I cut it at 10 feet, I'm still going to put at least 5 foot in the ground and have 5 feet sticking above it to put my bolts and attachments to and also run my guy anchors off of. Okay, let's go ahead and get to the nuts and bolts of the project. In this particular application, I'm going to be installing a foot cable as one of the sections of a mohawk walk on this project. Now what I've decided to do on this course is use a thimble eye bolt through the post itself and use a swedged end at this point. A couple advantages. One, it does bury the tail so there's no way a kid or a participant is going to go ahead and get their finger caught or cut open. Also, it gives a clean appearance. Now, when you put your thimble eye bolt into the post, you want to make sure to orient the head of the bolt vertically up and down. It's the strongest in this fashion, and if it was on its side, that's a weaker application. So with the, th the head of the bolt straight up and down, we're going to make sure we have a two and a quarter inch flat wash on the front, a two and a quarter inch flat wash on the back, a double lock coil washer, and then the nut that came with the bolt. Now when you put this on, you want to make sure you have enough thread of the bolt to at least go completely through the nut itself. Now if I was actually building this in a tree, for instance, the only really major difference would be one, to use round washers as it helps a tree protect and heal itself after you've done an invasive drilling. Make sure the washers are straight up and down oriented, tighten the bolt, you can use a blue smasher or a crescent wrench does just fine. Now in this pole situation, this is a brand new pole, so I want to go ahead and really tighten down the nut as much as possible and compress that double lock washer. Now when I come back on the first, second, and maybe third year of inspections, I'm going to be expecting to get some pole shrinkage, so I really want to check these nuts and make sure that they're still nice and tight. 
Now, if you don't have access to a swedging tool, a hydraulic, or any other kind of means to clamp this with a copper ferrule, there are other ways to terminate your cable. One of the more common ways to do that is again using a thimble lie bolt into the post and terminating the cable with two U clamps. Now, these are not your hardware purchase variety. These are not enabled, they're actually forged. Um, this particular case, the brand name is a Crosby, indicated by their red color. It's kind of their symbol and their mark. And you're gonna wanna go ahead and torque these down to about 45 pounds of torque like the manufacturer recommends you do so. Now, a couple things. A lot of common mistakes I see when this application is utilized is one, instead of a thimble eye bolt, it's just an oval eye bolt. And whenever you get a radical bend on the cable that's sharper than its width itself, you're gonna have a weak point right at that crimp or that bend. So if you're gonna use this method, please use a thimble eye bolt here. There's other attachments you can use if you don't have thimble eye bolts available, and I'll cover those in just a minute. Now, when you put on the U-clamp itself, the U portion of the clamp should go on the dead or the tail side of the cable, and the saddle should be on the working end or the portion that will be, step, that will be stood upon. And then at the end, the tail, you wanna go ahead and cover that up with a common serving sleeve. Now, in the swedge method, you don't have a tail to have to put a serving sleeve on. But in this application, you're gonna need one. Again, it keeps those little metal burrs from going in a person's finger, hand, or even the inspector when you're running your hand on to inspect it on an annual basis. Another way to go ahead and terminate these cables, if you don't wanna use the U-clamps, is another way is gonna be with these fist grips. Again, these are forged. They're not purchased from a hardware store. And I wanna take my thimble eye bolt, take my two and a quarter inch washer, Put it in the post. Again, I want to orient the bolt in an upward fashion or vertical. And I'm going to have my serving sleeve on there once again. Now, a couple advantages of a fist grip over a U-clamp is that a fist grip actually compresses the cable, cable evenly from all its diameter. Whereas on a U-clip, it actually will crimp the cable and put a dent in it. Anytime you dent that, it actually does deter and lose some of the strength of the cable. Whereas a fist grip is designed not to have any appreciable loss of strength. Again, you want to tighten those down to 45 pounds of torque, again like the manufacturer recommends. If I was to use this in a wraparound method, for example, in a tree, I could do the same, but I would want to introduce a staple pre-drilled on the back side to hold the cable up. And in a wraparound method, it would go around the tree just once. You wouldn't want to girdle it by wrapping it multiple times. And instead of using three clamps, or two clamps, excuse me, you would use three clamps because the third clamp would act as a redundancy. Now in the teardrop, if you did a wraparound, it's gonna be called a yoke. And the portion that would go around the tree itself is the yoke, and you wouldn't want to put your first clamp until at least the same distance of the tree diameter away from that point. Now I'm going to talk about this made-up yoke that I did here specifically. The primary difference between a foot cable and a belay cable is the fact that you have a backup system in case you had bolt failure itself. Now in this case here, let me go ahead and throw a washer plate on here to make sure it doesn't fall off on me. In this case here, this is a foot line cable. I have to protect against a couple things. Now the swedge itself is designed and rated to be as strong as the cable itself, if done properly. So I can always come back and retrofit this course, again using some fixed eyes with swedges and a nice beefy 5 8 inch rapid link. I can go ahead and wrap the pole, come around and clip through the eye of the bolt itself at that fixed point and lock it down. So at this point, I've effectively backed up in case the bolt head was the snap. Now I would probably trim this down so it wasn't quite so long, but additionally, I wouldn't want this to slide down the post or down the tree. So again, I could use a staple, pre-drill it as, as uh, previously shown, and place that here in the back of the post to hold it up in place. 
Now to see what that looks like graphically, let me just undo the nut and the washers in the back. Hold it up as if it was oriented. And now if the head of the bolt was to fail and pull out, you can see how the choker yoke would go ahead and back up the entire system. Other ways to do that, I'm mean, another common practice is to use a strand vise in your application. Strand vises are tricky in that, that they're designed to be under constant load. So when you install your strand vises on your cables, you want to go ahead and tension them by standing on them or loading them to begin with. Again, I want to install the bolt using a two and a half inch washer, and it's going to go ahead and go through the post. Now, a strand vise is set up with a bunch of jaws inside that allow the cable to move one direction, but then bite and hold it from going the other. Let me go ahead and throw a washer plate on this so I can work. That should hold for enough. Now again, what I want to back up here would be the bolt itself, and at this point, the jaws of the strand by slipping. And I can do that a couple of ways. One, I can go ahead and take extra cable through the strand vise, wrap it around the post, and then at this point here, I want to put either two U-clamps or two fist grips. That way, if the jaw is to slip, it's going to act as a yoke and it's going to hold itself firm. And if the bolt was to fail, again, it's going to act as a yoke. I'd want to get my cable trimmed off just right, put my two clamps, and put a serving sleeve on here. I have also seen people come around, take the cable itself, swedge a fixed eye in here, and again, use your rapid link, and attach back into the cable itself inside of the strand vise. Again, if we were to do this application and the bolt was to fail, it's going to act as a yoke and choke and girdle on the pole. If the strand vise is to slip, again, it's going to hold it. A couple of things you want to keep in mind and not do, again, I repeat, do not do, and a lot of times you'll see this in older courses, is actually use a staple or a shoulder leg eye screw as a fixed point to terminate a cable. One, they're not reliable and they're going to pull out. And two, there's been a lot of incidences where it's done that. So we can learn from previous mistakes of other vendors and other camps that have done home-built courses. Now, with the staple, we want to go ahead and orient it in that fashion. This is how you'll see it, but don't you do it. But then drive it in and then put the cable here. And when a person stands on it, that cable just goes ahead and pops right out and hits somebody. That's a very dangerous application. Another one is a shoulder leg eye screw or a slash, which is just a leg that goes into the pole, does not go all the way through, and again, as it wobbles and loads, it works its way loose, the person tensions the cable, and then again it pops on out. So the only way to do a foot cable, really, that we recommend is to go ahead and do a through bolt application here. And just for the record, here are those product advisories from 2000 and 2007 from McLean Power System. And we now have a similar letter from Hubble and all of their dead-end devices as well. Don't use dead-end devices, folks.